Welcome to a special bonus episode of Character Creation Spotlight, everyone. In this bonus segment, we'll be shining a light on some current or up-and-coming games to keep an eye out for. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and today my co-host Ryan and I are welcoming Pete Petrusha to talk about Chew, a forged in the dark, food-based crime drama RPG. Welcome back to Character Creation Spotlight, Pete. It's really great to have you here. Thanks. It feels like we can make it like a yearly ritual of this. That you're, you're, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you keep releasing games like this. I was going to say, you probably have a whole like schedule filled with the people who release at the same time every year. So. I know. <laughs> it's so many right now. Just Oh, we'll just put Pete on the calendar for every yeah. September. Like, hey, September's coming up. We should probably reach out to Pete because he's going to oh, be. See how he's doing. Yeah. I know he's he's trying to reach out to me right now. He just hasn't got there yet. I know. <laughs> well, Pete, uh, could you start off with reminding us a bit about yourself and uh, what sort of projects you have going on right now? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I uh, have a game company called Imagining Games. Uh, I'm a game publisher and game developer. Um, so the new game, as you mentioned, is Chew. It's based on the Image Comics. It's an award-winning comic series. It's really great. And I'm Super excited to get into talking about it. But uh, last time I was here, we were talking about Rest in Pieces. That was my uh, Jenga variant. It it was the favorite, my favorite quote that I heard was someone was like, it's like the love child of dread meets fiasco. Like, (laughs) you know, uh, it's a ridiculous roommate game about uh, deadbeat roommates who are stuck sharing the pad with the the Grim Reaper. So that's one of my jobs this month is to actually finally get that to backers. Because as you know, the world has been delayed Everything in our industry mm-hmm. has been delayed by shipping and freight who were small fries too. Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, I only got so much leverage to like get DHL to return my phone calls and tell me like truths, you know, they're always like, yeah, it's coming. It's so coming. many, like so many backer updates this month for various yeah. Kickstarters being like, we're sorry, but we have no control over it. And yeah. it's like, I know I understand. And I'm like, I'm sure there are people that are like, <laughs> where's my stuff? But I'm just like, it's fine. Gets here when it gets people here. Are so <laughs> like you can't wonderful right now about it but i i pride myself so much on being like the the, the guy who's on time <laughs> you know right. and it's like i just I mean, have to eat to my so words frustrating yeah. like to you know to be like i did everything right i was on oh. a schedule i had it all like you know i met my deadlines and they're like mm, but what if it sat in a shipping container for five months and you're like yeah. well, what if it didn't <laughs> <laughs> So it was supposed to be shipping like right now. And then of course now I, uh, tell everyone, I know October it's coming. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Anyway, games. We like games. <laughs> yes. Thank you for being here. So this is an abridged version of our usual episodes. We're going to kind of stick to the highlights of things and not go as deep as we normally would. Sure. Um, we're going to just kind of focus in on character creation without further ado. <laughs> We're going to talk about what this game is all about. Yeah. What's in a game? All right. Uh, yeah. Could you go ahead and start off by telling us a bit about the core concept for Chew? I can't help but with the food puns. I'm like, well, it's a mouthful. So are you ready? Um, <laughs> so let's start That's with Ryan's food for dream. thought, right? Like, yeah. So yeah, please. with Chew, uh, like I said, it's based off an image comic series. What's really neat is basically um, in, listen to the similarities because it's almost surreal now with what we've been going through. So like in the 2010s ish, the creator would say five, it's always five years ago in a world like our own, the bird flu went crazy and the bird flu killed over a hundred million people, which of course that matters some, but it killed over 20 million in the U S. So the U S had to do something about it. So the food and drug administration became like the most powerful law enforcement agency in the world. And they became like Homeland security in the wake of the, uh, the, 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 basically the, the pandemic that happened and mm-hmm. chicken was outlawed. Because it was the bird flu, right? It was passed by poultry. (laughs) And this is in a world where there are superpowers, um, but they're based on either cooking or eating foods. So any power you have is only only manifest by either. Well, I mean, there are some like somebody could wear spaghetti on their head and that's when they're 10 times stronger, but only as long as they're wearing spaghetti on their head. Um, (laughs) But it's an absurd world that's very similar to ours where, you know, the FBI and the CIA are almost not existent. Uh, where the FDA is above the law. Uh, They are policing things like chicken trafficking, egg dealing and food, food criminals. Right. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. and the USDA is like their, their next of kin who's also risen up to the challenge. Um, There are, there's strange writing in the sky. So there's some evidence of aliens and this is all in the backdrop of 
really a story that's much more about like quirky characters, like weird agents um, and absurd characters that are, have over the top, like fatal flaws more than it is like a, a, a police procedural investigative game. That's like Delta green and takes itself really seriously. Right. So mm-hmm. it has a little more to do with like your primetime cop shows. That's all about the cast and what they're dealing with in their personal lives. Oh, and by the way, this there's a serial killer this week. So, mm. So a very serious game. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> it's neat because one of the things the comics does really well that we emulate with the game is that every, you know, session is going to try to have that case of the week. But with some of the tools we're going to show you and talk about, these conspiracies are going on in the background. And what's cool in the game is we get to kind of like the players almost kind of build them out of thin air over time as Mm. things begin to make connections. Um, But in the comics, that's kind of one of the things they were really good at is each issue felt complete. It never felt slow. It never felt brooding. It always felt like, bam, that was a great issue. I can't wait for the next one. But then over the arc of every five issues, there was something bigger going on, whether it was in personal Mm. lives or building towards some grand conspiracy or, you know, uh, uh, betrayal or, you know, something that was always growing. And so that's one of the things we're looking at is the playing to the campaign play as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Beyond the fun of just silly one shots. So. Oh, I like that. So the setting is like, you know, I mean, like roughly our own yep. sort of like alternate. Um, and if there are like superpowers and things like that, is there like advanced tech too or is that like mostly related to food also so what's really really funny is that clearly you know in this absurd world uh, like (laughs) the fda and the usda have like super like their budgets are just blown out of proportion right they're given all the money they could possibly want Mm -hmm. to handle the the crimes of the day um and nasa is kind of like our third wing like the if there was the next agency that'd be kind of the most uh, common for the players to be, it'd probably be NASA. And NASA, if you could imagine them like fully funded to the point that they're just blowing money, it's pretty ridiculous what they have going on too. But yeah, yeah. So like the um, USDA, for example, is uh, every one of the partners. So it's kind of like every special agent has a partner, right? Every special mm-hmm. agent in the USDA has a partner, which is a cybered animal. So it's a cyber enhanced animal. They always have like a, a like a metal a casing over one eye with a red eye, like Chino <laughs> from Mortal Kombat. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, and it's really ridiculous. Like in the comics, you'll see like uh, what like uh, I was trying to think of that cockadoodle. Like what are those birds called? Parakeets and like uh, toucans and giraffes and lions and you know anything you can think of. <laughs> so um, that's a fun thing. And then what we see is also that that robotics division builds uh, and helps them uh, when people are like really horribly wounded, like replacing them, uh, giving them replacement cybernetics, which often ends up being animal themed as well, like a crab a claw or like the bottom oh, half of a horse. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always absurd. Um but yeah, yeah, there's that. And then like the FDA have all these advanced food powered weapons. <laughs> so they have like t- dedicated teams and yeah. And some of the food powers are harnessed to make new technologies, but that's, yeah, we're right. Like whatever you can imagine right. is almost what you can yeah. have in this game. Very cool. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. So what sort of materials then do we need to play a game of two? So you need your play sheets. Uh, we use playbooks because it's forged in the dark. Mm -hmm. Um, we have, uh, six sided dice is the only dice you need, obviously pencil, pen, whatever. But one of the interesting things we have is we've brought uh, a cork board into play. So all that is, is a whiteboard. Um, you know, if you back the Kickstarter, we'll have a quad full dry erase board that you fold out that looks like a cork board out of the comics. And you could imagine from investigative games, you know, usual or, or TV shows, like you'll see like photographs and people's names underneath and little rings and strings tying them together to like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, crime rings and stuff. So we're playing off that. But at the center of the table, what it really does is one, it, it lets us see in like we use post-its, post-its and then like yeah. making lines with uh, dry erase markers. We put like a oh, okay. post-it that's like, what is the case? Because every, every, you know, every game started with like kind of a mission based thing. You get a supervisor who's like, hey, this is the case. Go check this out, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. This is the case that we call chicken run because there's missing chickens. And then mm-hmm. the depending on what kind of game we're playing, the base game is usually has this investigative base. So we'll put three blue details, three blue post-its that say, we're looking for a suspect, a method, and a motive. And then as we find other leads, some will be included usually in the brief, 
with yellow, we just start putting random thoughts that come up or people we meet or places we go or leads that we think are interesting. So the players are using it just as much as the game master is, is we're all just plotting things out and drawing lines between things as they make sense or question marks. Um, so having a whiteboard is really useful because what you'll see in play is it pulls all that great stuff on your character sheet that's usually lost on the back side or on the bottom right yeah. corner. It puts it all in the forefront. And oh, that's cool. all the player characters have some kind of personal trouble, which give it like a tropic thunder element, right? Like, you know, mm. the agent that's over the top that shows up in the jungle and he's like, I got your Devo to keep that alive <laughs> in the game, right? Like those exist in the corkboard as well. So players can remind us or connect random things to it. And this all leads to also how these conspiracies can start to pop up over time. So, oh, that's cool. Yeah. I, like that. I love that. I like the idea of being able to like grab things from like, oh, yeah. ago and being like, actually this, <laughs> like, <laughs> and it was a bit of a challenge because, you know, other games have done, you know, like you've, you've clearly you two have played a lot of games, seen a lot of character creation that have like these hopes of like, oh, here's a one page handout that we put as the group, you know, template sheet of some kind. Um, but mm-hmm. we found that this is just uh, it's fun. And one of the mm-hmm. big things that's important for us is like we are saying so often, it's got an investigative base, but it's really about the characters. So as much as we can put the important stuff on the table and make it kind of obvious, the less we have our players like really trying to puzzle out every detail and every whodunit thing. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So every, every element that we can do to tame that kind of play and let you just be role playing your character to your heart's content is what we're trying to put in. So very, very cool. cool. Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. It gives us a neat option for the future, though. When you want to play like assassins, we just change those blue three blue details, and it's like the routine of the the mark. Where's the target, and like who, where, how are they vulnerable? And one of the things that we won't get to see today is they as like the FDA is above the law. They don't need mm-hmm. all three to be successful. As long as they can point the finger at anybody, they can go go try to crack the case on them and shut it down. Because oh. <laughs> it's again, it's about the characters. The case is just the flavor of the week. So even if they're really, yeah. really good, it's the player's uh, option to play like what they want to play, when they want to play it. And if their character's just slacking off and hanging out and drinking beers instead of like working, that's an element of the game too. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Can you um, talk to us a little bit about like what kinds of characters people can play? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, eight playbooks. Um, It doesn't. uh, We're going to see if they're all available (laughs) when we start. But the current plan is that there is the expert. Uh, The expert's like a highly educated luminary in their field. Um, One of the popular characters in the the fiction is Amelia, uh, which is great here. Right. Amelia is a column writer, a food column writer. (laughs) And her food power is that whatever she writes, you can actually taste. So she's very successful oh. at our job. Um, wow. But it is pretty amazing that she could even be standing in front of you, giving a speech and explaining to you how bad something tastes and you'll vomit. So <laughs> the, uh, the hot shot, uh, as you could imagine, the brash one of the, the typical police duo will stop at nothing to crack the case. We have the inspector who's our more by the book, the, the shrewd detective, uh, the low life. This might be an informant. This might be a snitch. This might be a reformed character or they just might really be a criminal that we're, we need their help. Um, the mascot is an innocent soul who acts selflessly to support others. So one of the elements that's really neat in Chew is the family. The family really comes to play, like who are important in these people's lives, whether their family, relationships, like what are people going home to? That it isn't, their life isn't all work unless they're the inspector. So Mm -hmm. uh, the mascot's a great way to touch on that of being like, are you the estranged child? Are you the best friend? The the fear of missing out friend who bothers me every minute of the day, wondering what I'm up to. (laughs) Um, there's the prodigy, um, in the typical fashion, right? Like the person who just has all the skills and the talents, but just started yesterday. It's probably a little, mm-hmm. <laughs> get a, um, a poop eating grin. <laughs> so mm-hmm. the, um, and then clearly when we have the veteran, right? The opposite, the expertise one, the salty one, the bitter one, right? Maybe, mm-hmm. uh, and the wronged, the wronged is the element is, um, Sometimes, like in this case, where we have all these government agencies, people get burned. Maybe they step on toes politically. Maybe they start trying to pursue a case that like their agency just doesn't think is a thing, like they don't care about. Or something mm-hmm. happens to you and you, you want your vengeance. So these are people who they can be your Wolverine character almost, right? They're obsessive with a dark past. So, yeah. Oh, I love it. Mm-hmm. All right. So I think. That's all we need to know. Uh, can you walk us through uh, the process to create some characters yeah, right now? Yeah, for sure. 
Let's make some people. So as you get your character sheets ready and out, I know that, uh, like I mentioned, if you if you have the visuals of the full one, it might help you with some of the explainer text. Mm-hmm. But we can basically just kind of move in different directions. But I'll just go to what seems like it flows well here. Um, so one of the first things that we want to do is we want to look at your attributes. So, um, well, I'm sorry. First of all, we have to know what playbooks you picked, right? Because yes. that, that determines right. which special uh, like playbook related abilities you have to pick from. So absolutely. Of the things I All mentioned, right. uh, what, what are you thinking? I'm thinking mascot. Mm-hmm. I just got to lean into the uh, the innocent Surprised. soul who acts selflessly to help others. <laughs> uh, you got to do what you know, right? There you yeah, go. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go with the wrong. All that's right. That's fine. Nice. Uh, you want to do one too, Pete? Oh, yeah, sure. How about I do? do I'll do the prodigy. Nice. All right. Okay. It'll be a fun team. I <laughs> pull my character up to you and click on over here. Okay. I feel like you two load faster than I do. <laughs> as, I, <laughs> as I try to click things. All right. So there are four attributes. Uh, mm-hmm. When you go to roll um, for anything in this game, eventually we're going to narrow it down to which attribute it sounds like. Uh, and Fortune of the Dark players know that the player is the one who gets to pick which attribute they want to use. And then the mm-hmm. game master responds with what kind of uh, position or risk there is and what kind of effect you might have, uh, you know, outcome like benefit, yeah. like, right. Is, is this something where you have standard effect, limited effect or great effect? And it, mm-hmm. it gives that conversation moment where the player can go, Oh, well, I thought it'd be different than that. What if I did this instead? So there mm-hmm. was have this bit of a meta conversation, but the attributes, so there's charm, there's guts, there's instinct, and there's training. Uh, each of your playbooks has one of those already selected for you to kind of show you a little leaning of where they're going. Um, charm is your ability to influence others and to measure your personality. Uh, guts is your ability to act with confidence, stay cool under pressure, or just tough it out. And then instinct is your intuition, observational acuity, and your ability to react quickly. And training is your ability to recall information or act with discipline and precision. All right. The pretty typical tropes when it comes to most investigative, you know, uh, you could imagine investigative games, whether it was Sherlock Holmes or Scooby-Doo. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And then you'll get three extra stars that you can play. So for people at home, every one of these attributes can have a possibility of three stars. And if you had the number of stars you have is the number of dice you would get to roll when you were going to do oh, something very nice. with it. So it, it looks like I've got uh, one already in charm mm-hmm. uh, as the mascot. So I'm assuming I get that one and then three more on top of you it. You do, yeah. Uh, wherever I want. Wherever you want, but you're limited to two in any one category at character creation. Oh, okay. But the prodigy, I think I'm going to go two in guts and two in instinct. Nice. <laughs> so I just added one to, to charm. Uh, to give it two and added one to guts and one to instinct. All right. I, I should mention. So if you don't have any stars, you just, you roll two D six and you take the lower result. So you, you always okay. can roll. That makes sense. And Amelia, what about you? Uh, I think I'm going to put one in charm and two in instinct. Okay. For those that aren't familiar with Fortune in the Dark, uh, basically when you roll the dice, it isn't a matter of necessarily how many dice you have to roll. Uh, to get a degree of success, you just want the one highest die roll. That's pretty much what matters. If you get a six, Mm -hmm. pretty much whatever you were going for is going to go off without a hitch. If you get a four Mm -hmm. and five, you're going to succeed, but there will be some consequences. Um, But ultimately, whatever it was you're trying to do, that does happen, but there may just be other things that happen or off to the side or some Mm -hmm. sacrifice. If you're in a fight, you get hurt too, right? If you roll Mm -hmm. one through three, uh, it's just bad. And then depending on that position is how bad Um, Mm -hmm. there are criticals, which is if you get two sixes. So that's one case where it helps to have more than one die. Um, Mm -hmm. But there aren't fumbles in uh, Forge in the Dark, though. I would argue that if you're in a desperate situation and you end up with the one through three, it's pretty much like a fumble. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I just listened to a uh, one of the International Podcast Month episodes that used a Forge in the Dark system. Uh, Quietus, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, and and I, I finally 
understand Forged in the Dark now. <laughs> you know what's so funny about that is I have a copy and I, I bought it a while back and I was really excited that I think it's Ali Jeffrey's game, if I say the name right. Hmm. And it, I was really, t- it's just really cool again. And it's a neat like horror movie-esque yeah. game. Um, and I don't think one time I thought about it over the course of making and working in this game as a Forge <laughs> in the Dark game. And you just blew my mind. I was like, oh, it's so cool. Like two years ago and it's on my shelf and I never pulled it out to compare, <laughs> which is weird for me, right? Like I'm Mr. Research. So. Uh-huh. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, it was a really fun game. Oh, I haven't got to play it yet, though. I can't wait. So we can move, just move right along to the right side uh, to make it easy with the sheets. Going to quirks. Mm-hmm. So uh, your quirks. Oh, sorry. I forget the two of you using the online sheets. So if you scroll down, yeah. you'll see uh, the quirks. So basically, we have like four here that you could pick easily by just checking a box. Um, mm-hmm. And then you're always welcome to either come up with your own or pick from the list. So mm-hmm. this is just for, uh, you know, ease of new players, right? Okay. But the quirks in this game are kind of like the one cool thing you can do, kind of. <laughs> because mm-hmm. they're sometimes the last thing we talk about, unlike most superhero games, because in this game, we're always thinking about the fiction. So when you go mm-hmm. to do anything... I'm thinking about what kind of an effect you'd have based on everything on your character sheet and everything you described to me. And with that in mind, we, we stole from masks, which is a powered by the apocalypse game in what we ended up doing with these powers. Um, Amelia, you want to list a couple of yours, like just to give people at home an idea of the examples here. Um, oh yeah. Well, let's see if I can say these oh, yeah. as I try to read them. Um, Torta Espadero. <laughs> You have the ability to wield tortilla chips as lethal weapons. <laughs> um, let's see here. Effervenductor. You can create mind-controlling messages in edible forms. Foams. Edible Foams. Foams. Oh, look at that. Think barista. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, these are wild. Animate constructs out of mashed potatoes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so w- what we're getting at is that a lot of times they're super oddly specific and they're, they're all kind of weird. And sometimes like um, there's a good one of like, you can uh, share memories if we all share a meal, but that's the kind of power that you might use once a session. Like you're going to build to mm-hmm. that. Right. So we found that with these quirks, it's really like a permission narratively. Like you can just do these things. I mean, clearly mm-hmm. like making mashed potato golems is easy for you, but it maybe takes time. So maybe like another mm-hmm. fortune in the dark ways, we might use clocks. If you were building an army of how long it takes to build an army. Right. Yeah. Sure. Um, but otherwise you can do these things. And we found that by limiting them previously to like expenditures of other, you know, uh, we're going to talk about appetite eventually that we were just holding people back from doing the coolest things. Um, mm-hmm. So with the effect, the position effect system, this has been really easy to implement and let people use whatever powers they want as often as they want. So. Mm-hmm. Some of the characters also have celebrity in here. Uh, we have like day Futuro, which is like the person who's from 30 years in the future who's come back. Um, so these, these are all, they're not all food powers, but right. Like, right. But they could be that and the other random weird things that make characters unique. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, so I'm going with uh, Victus uh, Speciosian. <laughs> uh, you can radically, radically alter your appearance with food-based beauty products. Nice. Yeah, love it. I have uh, I I struggle as much as everyone else. Right. I have I think it's Exoco Scalpair, which is I can carve functional objects out of chocolate. Oh, oh, that's really cool. And Amelia, which one did you pick? Um, I am going to go with uh, tortilla chips as lethal weapons. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's amazing. (laughs) <laughs> and then now we get to arguably the most important thing in your sheet which is the approaches um mm-hmm. so on your online sheet this one actually would have been right next to your attributes mm-hmm. if you click that little scroll box thing you can see different choices that are there um mm-hmm. and there's a whole list now these are kind of like personality traits but they're traits that everyone in this world identifies you with Okay. The list is all categorized in ways we would describe food. <laughs> so you could imagine if you were a character that's 100% raw, 
that you say what's on your mind. And if we ever Mm -hmm. had to withhold information, we'd probably hold that against you because you're always speaking your mind and we can see it on your face. Um, If you're a beefcake, right, you're clearly like a buff and big and tough. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're bitter, we we know that you're kind of a cynic, right? You probably are always going to have that harsh uh, tone to your voice. Uh, The corn dog is the person who always says the puns, right? The hard boiled is clearly our detective that just is always on the move, persistent and relentless. But yeah, you pick three of these. And every time you go to do anything, I probably as a game master, I'm going to say, hey, what are your approaches? Until I remember them by heart, because I'm Mm -hmm. always going to be thinking about how they modify your effect when you do whatever it is you're doing. And sometimes I'm be like, oh, yeah, this is a small hole in your bite size. Don't even roll like you just walk right through. But the next person who's a beefcake, they're going to have some difficulty. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. So look through those. If you have questions about what those uh, are, I know you have that quick start guide if you want to look at the the sentence descriptions, but they're used very broadly. So Mm -hmm. you can pick out three that interest you for your character. Yeah. Spicy. Spicy is the passionate one, right? You're Mm -hmm. the live wire. Oh, Ryan, you went exactly what I thought. (laughs) (laughs) Vanilla is if you want to be the normal person in the world where everyone's weird, right? Like, (laughs) yep, I love it. Ryan, what'd you pick? I went with uh, Egghead, Delicious, and Sweet Pea. (laughs) And Amelia, what'd you pick? Um, I picked exactly what you'd think I would pick. I yep. picked conspiracy nut, spicy, and bold. <laughs> <laughs> Spot on. And what did you pick? Oh, and then I have a uh, beefcake, 100% raw and mouthy. Nice. Perfect. Uh, I, I like the beefcake with the prodigy just because you kind of always expect like a kid. So it's, it's yeah. kind of right. switches up the, the, the mental picture. Yeah. Um, next. You want to look at the perks, which are what's special about your playbook. These are all your like list of special abilities. There's a, mm-hmm. usually, I think there's eight of each on each one of them. Um, by the base game, you would pick one. But when we play one shots, I have people pick two because their characters are, are the FDA and everyone's pretty good at their job or experience mm-hmm. and specialized. Like every single person that works in the USDA is like a female that's like ex special forces. So they're all like super badass, every single one of them. So I'm like, ah, you know, picking two often makes sense. Yeah. So take a look. I, I know um, on mine, um, I the first one I have on my list is Mental Palace for the Prodigy. Um, it's I, maybe I like the name. That might be part of it. Is that mm-hmm. so when you dig in, in addition to any other effects, choose one. You receive a perfect mental map of your surroundings, or you know exactly what's about to happen, though the final outcome remains fuzzy. Mm. So that brings up uh, what these will bring up a lot of times are different mechanics, right? So Mm -hmm. digging in is one of the ways that you can uh, spend your resource in this Forge in the Dark game that we call appetite. It's kind of like your will or your drive to carry on, uh, your appetite mm-hmm. to continue. Um, if you you can spend two points of your eight appetite to uh, dig in, which is like lean into one of your approaches, be descriptive with it, and get an extra mm-hmm. die or more effect. Um, okay. If you want to help someone else, you can do the same thing: spend one appetite and lend a hand. But then you're tied to mm-hmm. the consequences. Very cool. So in this case, mental palace. Not only do I get the benefit of digging in. But if I did spend the appetite, I also always get this benefit if I pick this perk. So nice. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I went with Ninja Cream Puff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the mascot's got some of my personal favorites just because they're so amazing it. and like ridiculous and comical. And so uh-huh. what's Ninja Cream Puff? So this one, people underestimate you when you let them. You may engage in hand-to-hand combat with charm (laughs) without suffering a penalty to your position or effect. Yeah. Amazing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm just a sweetheart. Uh, You keep believing that. (laughs) (laughs) Amelia, did any of them jump out to you for the wrongs? Um, Okay, so I really like... Oh, language list, Ryan. You're gonna have to figure out how to edit this. That's on you. <laughs> list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you keep a list of anyone who has wronged you. 
gain uh, gain effect when you act to undermine them. Recover three appetite when you cross someone off your list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really fun because of the cork port. So like the wronged with that, we often see them. Do they just slap and everybody be down? They're like <laughs> everybody that looked at them wrong, everyone that like slighted them ever in their life. And in Force yep. in the Dark Games, we also have flashbacks, right? So you can kind of to help you jump into the action when you want to uh, mm-hmm. or to take desperate actions and not be held back as a player who may have forgot something. Um What's fun is you add that to like the wronged in a couple of cases here too, of like you might, the wrong might meet someone and be like, all right, we're adding them to the list. They didn't even say anything yet. And you're like, yeah, but what they did six months ago. And let me tell you all about that. And then slap new connection. Like flashback. (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So perks, as you can imagine, right, they're, they're usually things that are either giving you more of a benefit for digging in, uh, mm-hmm. things that like with the hot shot, for, for example, or trying to encourage you to be brash, encourage you to take more desperate and risky actions, right? Uh, and then clearly with some of them like the veteran or in this case, the wronged, we want them to make better use of the court board, right? It's about the connections. Mm-hmm. The wronged is one of those characters that's building a, a their own storyline in a way, right? They're, they're building a conspiracy even by their, their playbook design. So uh, it's very clear that we're having them constantly be playing with the connections and looking at the court board with more opportunities for them to find stuff to latch things yeah. onto. Um, so we mentioned appetite. Uh, you would start with that full track uh, on the front page. There's also these conditions. Um, it doesn't have health. So basically what happens is when you would take damage, whether it's psychologically, mentally, physically, any, any of the above, you would take conditions. So the conditions in this game are, are based off of the four attributes. So your charm can become manipulative. Your mm-hmm. guts can start to become ruthless. Your instinct can become impulsive and your training can lead to you becoming cocky. And, as you're using these attributes, kind of like an approach, these new conditions are now taken into consideration with everything you do. So, yeah, okay. you are a charming character, but now everyone's starting to notice that your charm is it as charming as it used to be because it's a little more cutthroat. It's You've become manipulative. So these conditions, as you take uh, riskier and riskier actions, you might take one of these, you might take two of these, you might even take three of these if there was something like really desperate in a horrible situation that got thrown at you. And when you take all four plus one, Clearly, you're kind of at our liberty of, uh, you know, um, one of the things with Chu is Chu can get really, really dark because the title character, um, as we talked a lot about food and RPGs and the silly and lighthearted side, the title character's power is that they see the origins of whatever they eat. So Hmm. um, when you become a criminal investigator and start investigating things like murder, it it becomes very quickly that everyone's pushing cadavers. And uh, pushing, hey, mm-hmm. just take a bite. Let me know, is this marriage a good idea? Like suddenly every <laughs> you're eating people, whether you want to or not. Um, oh. uh, so what we want to do with Forge in the Dark is Forge in the Dark has this amazing way to resist things. Players, as long as they have appetite, can be like, whoa, 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 Game Master. No, we don't need to go there. Or I don't want that to happen to my character. And they can choose to resist. And what you do is the GM then tells you which attributes are roll, but it always succeeds. That just determines how much it costs you an appetite to resist. Okay. So the, what's neat is we can kind of mirror that in this game by the GM can, can describe and go right down the road until the X cards t- touched or, you know, to whatever degree they want to. And then the player always has that option to be like, yeah, yeah, let's no, 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 no. That's not happening. Um, mm-hmm. So we can kind of have our cake and eat it too when it comes to going there and having that tension <laughs> mm-hmm. of describing in the player being, I don't know. He didn't say I can resist. Can I resist? Can I resist? Wait a second. Hold on. Let me, I'm not done yet. <laughs> you know. And then they can still have that agency if they want. Um, so yeah, when you take your fifth condition, right, you'd be knocked out or worse if you were out of appetite. But um, the fun thing to mention there is that each one of them has a clear condition. So in Force in the Dark games, they have something called downtime usually. Um, after the investigative in this case or the heist play, the core gameplay, you'd have like this sort of downtime afterwards of like what happens between cases. Mm-hmm. Um, in Chu, we actually slapped that right in the middle of the investigation phase. So we don't have downtime like normal, mm. but the conditions can be cleared by doing social things and taking a scene to do so. Or if you had plenty of time, you could use one of your downtime activities to take some R&R in the middle of the case <laughs> with mm-hmm. other penalties, right? But yeah, like 
if you're manipulative and you want to get rid of it, you just have to lie to an ally. But like you need a little scene there to like make that it's got to be something they're going to they're going to find out that you lied to them. They're going to remember that you lied to them. Why did you lie to them? They were trying to build this chemistry of these real people, right? Vulnerable people, quirky people, Um, ruthless. How do you clear it? You have to lash out against an ally. Um, Impulsive, clear by inviting trouble which we're going to walk mm. right into next. And then mm-hmm. cocky, clear to clear cocky, you have to refuse aid. So there's got to be a moment where like, mm. you clearly should be taking help or not going alone, but you're going to yeah. say, you know, what I'm doing here is I'm refusing aid so that I can clear my cocky trade and I'm moving on. And I know it's a bad idea as a player, but that's what I'm doing. So the only thing we really didn't do here, other than giving yourself a name and a pronoun is we didn't talk about your trouble. So every character walks in with some unique personalized trouble, Uh, something that no matter what you do or no matter how hard you try, will find Mm -hmm. its way to wiggle its way to the forefront of your investigation for the FDA and cause you problems (laughs) and probably eventually cause the rest of your your, uh, team, crew, squad problems. Well, Mm -hmm. um, they have categories like debt, romance, rivalry, uh, family, vice. but some of my favorites are like the conspiracy nut who uh, their problem is with combo utensils. They're <laughs> abhorrent. They shouldn't exist. And that this person has a podcast uh, that rails against combo utensils. Um, so this was a rivalry in their case. Right. Um, but these usually like, well, we have examples. There are things you make up. Something yeah. that you make that's specific uh, and usually tied to at least one other person uh, that's okay. of importance. Very nice. Yeah. Um, family. I chose, I chose romance for my. Oh, did you? Yeah. Of course you did. Of course. <laughs> Guess what I picked? Guess which one? It's got. It's got to be. Uh, it's got to be rivalry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you two are a great compliment, though. You know. <laughs> it's, we know each other well at this point, and like we, you know, I think at first we we tried to like play outside our boxes and then in the last like year or so we're like let's just you can always make a magical girl and i'll always make a necromancer and we'll all be happy Which, yep. it, well it's very great for chew because there's always this this long line of history of like police procedural games that have like the partner combo right the tango and cash mm-hmm. so it's every time you two have said anything it's always been like that like the opposites that shouldn't be together but yep. of course they are mm-hmm. so. yep Yep. Yeah. No, I could definitely see this as like a great buddy cop. Like, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you would like your obnoxious, like you probably have like a pink fuzzy thing around the <laughs> steering wheel mm-hmm. of the, the car. And yeah. Mm-hmm. The best part mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. and I'm like, we only play metal on the CD player. <laughs> these things would be added to the court board and you would start to uh, tie them to each other and maybe even put them between you and talk about like who hates and who loves this, <laughs> what mm-hmm. irritates so and so. And I love it. It's wonderful because then it's very easy for things to come full circle. Right. Mm-hmm. As then later mm-hmm. on, when the car explodes, um, you know, your, your, your friend, what your frenemy here walks, comes back with your pink steering wheel cover and goes, yeah, but I got you, bro. I got you. You know, like, <laughs> <Right. laughs> they know, they know Absolutely. it was important. They couldn't save the car, yeah. but I got this. I got you fuzzy. You dice. can get another car. <laughs> this priceless. Yep. <laughs> uh, what did you go with you for your trouble, uh, Pete? Um, let me see. I was talking too much. That's fine. I think I am going to go with, I like a rivalry for the prodigy in general, just because Mm -hmm. they just seem like the person who's just always got to be challenged. Uh, And if there's not a challenge, they're probably finding ways to make a challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, In in Chu, the supervisor is almost like your biggest villain because your Mm. supervisor is the one who you're going to talk to throughout, is going to give you the cases. And at the end of the day, you're going to have to report back to and tell mm-hmm. them the good and the bad of what happened. Um, in in the stories of the comics, uh, they play this up very much. Like sometimes you have the boss that just hates you from day one for no good reason. And everything that you do is the bane of their existence. Um, <laughs> so we like to play that up as well. And we in the Kickstarter, we hope to have different pro- boss profiles because everyone who knows who's had multiple bosses, right? That like, doesn't matter how great your job is or how much it sucks, the, j- the boss can make the whole, all, it can be all that matters, right? Like if your yeah. boss is amazing. Your job sucks. You kind of put up with it because, you know, it's not that bad, but if your job is amazing and it pays really well, but your boss is horrible and a tyrant, you're out of there. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
<laughs> so Absolutely. my rival would probably be with the boss because I'd like to be the one who would, you know, be sticking the middle finger to the boss. But that they just sense. couldn't get rid of me because I'm the prodigy. I'm just too good for some reason. They can't quite put their <laughs> finger on. And I'd love to have that <laughs> ongoing relationship. Absolutely. So I'm sure that there'd be like a picture on their desk or I'd be trying to like date their son or daughter or something, you know, just yep. something to really get under their skin and show up all the time. So yeah, maybe oh, I would crazy. do that. I would pick out like some kind of romantic relationship as a rivalry though. Right. It's, mm-hmm. it's not because mm-hmm. I actually care about the person. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. Uh huh. Yeah. And then on the back sheet, you don't pick these, but like every playbook has different, like five unique pieces of gear which are just fun things like uh, like the low life has like contraband, <laughs> which gives them kind of permission to like say what it is that they have that they shouldn't have. Yeah. Um, I know on the prodigy, I have a crime solving kit, a Nutra kick, which is an affordable and nutrient rich in 1000 milligrams of caffeine energy bar. <laughs> oh boy. I have a fake ID and a gaming laptop, you know, so. Oh, so good. I've got uh rookies gear. Uh, puppy dog eyes, <laughs> <laughs> a winning smile, uh, street chic, and uh, snacks. I love it. I have a conspiracy blog. No, of course. Oh. Of course, Jay. Right? <laughs> That's perfect. You have to be heard. And a, and a hidden lair. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that like that's like the best one we ever made was like oh. when when the oh. when the the wrong out of nowhere is like well i have a hidden lair and everyone's like what <laughs> yeah. yeah like is it an underground bunker or an rv in the woods yep <laughs> like the a maniacal laugh as well it's oh, truly it's so unsettling <laughs> it's so good right so just more things that add to effect mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, more more things for the player to be like oh man so i thought of real charm but he, the GM's telling me that this is like risky limited. Like I just wouldn't be that effective with what I'm doing. But when mm. I can start being like, but I have this and my approach is this suddenly it's standard. It might even be great now because my church is really mm-hmm. good with the stuff that I have. It makes me different. So mm-hmm. I, I, I really love that. That's probably the best thing we, we really liked with Forge in the Dark for this universe. The true universe mm-hmm. is that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it ended up fitting like a glove unexpectedly. And the big part is that is that like it, it promotes just describing the coolest thing that you want to do whenever you want to do it and like mm-hmm. going for it. And I like that it shines a spotlight on taking risky and desperate actions because we want to reward that sometimes because in the comics, mm-hmm. that's what they do. Right. They like run into mm-hmm. trouble. So there's literally times where they're like two to three weeks after that, I'm taking care of this right now. I'm going home. <laughs> you know, so. I'm not, not waiting for a warrant. Yeah. So we can we can we can push those buttons uh, comically Mm -hmm. and players can be those characters. And then the Mm -hmm. more they know of this world, you don't need to, but the more they have, the more descriptive they are, the more that they can really feel they're there, but also be rewarded. Right. Mechanically. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. That's awesome. Absolutely. Um, I think we're on names now. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. So I got to tell you, anybody who's anybody has food in their name. (sighs) I I mean, I, I already did it. I don't. So like, for example, some of the characters in the game are like, so there's Tony Chu, uh, who is of, uh, you know, Asian American family, CHU. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. But when you go to his partner, it's John Colby. Uh, His his girlfriend is Amelia Mintz, but it's like with a Z at the end. Mm -hmm. Uh, His daughter's name is Olive. Um, (laughs) uh, Their boss is uh, Mike Appleby. (laughs) <laughs> oh, there you go. And hmm. let's see who else. Mason's normal. Caesar's normal. Hmm. As I try to think of, I know um, I got it. a lot of the characters, that's one of the things we try to do is to like promote players being, you know, whatever gender or whatever pronouns they prefer. We usually give them like a last name with food, like macchiato or something. Mm-hmm. And then like a first initial so that they can, you know, flesh it out to their content. Mm-hmm. All right, Ryan, what did you go with? I went with uh, Emery Wellington, she, her pronouns. Wellington, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's I went like a well-aged with, steak. Uh, uh-huh. mm, uh, I went with Marion Cobb, they, them. Nice, Cobb. <laughs> that's so good. Um, I think, oh, you said that, I'm going to say, how about Miles Mako? For oh. the Prodigy, it's like a shark. Nice. Love it. <laughs> I would probably go, I'd probably go they, them. So, <laughs> Teach my mind. Very cool. 
Nice. And I, I saw there was some personal details you could fill out as well. Um, mm -hmm. There's the, the beat. What's your connection to the case? Um, the look and the bio. I'm assuming that the, the beat probably is more applicable to when we're actually playing the game at that point. So the beat is like, we, we think it's going to be changed to your background just because that's the term that makes the most sense. We, we like beat, you know, building the game is we're like, oh, it's like your mm -hmm. beat. It's like a cop term. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But really, it's become at this point is we've really fine tuned the game. It's just kind of a background. Um, mm -hmm. And what it means is like, where, what kind of work do you do for the FDA? Like, what's your wheelhouse? Mm -hmm. How did you get involved? Are you an informant? Ah, Have you been a sense. field agent? Are you a civilian expert? right? Like you're really more of a contractor. Um, are you a journalist more so that we can kind of have that to pull from, you know, it's not super mm -hmm. important, but sometimes it is, but it, it, what we like about it is when the players are thinking about it, it may give them like more of a delineation of what kind of character they are instead of them being like, Oh, we're all FBI agents, right? We're all FDA. Like mm -hmm. they're not seeing like, uh, Mully and Skull, uh, Mully and Skulder, uh, Scully and Mulder, um, you know, in every way, right? They're looking and they're like, right. oh, I could be, but I could be an informant. I could be a snitch in the streets. And you're the person who's actually the, you know, the agent. I'm the rookie. And, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think even having like one sentence there can determine a lot when you're role playing. Yeah. For like what, you know, how did I get here? That makes sense. Why am I here? <laughs> One of the funny things in the comics is since the FDA is like the big honcho in the government, they clearly uh, can kind of get whatever they want. So there's a lot of times where like the USDA is like loaning agents to them or they have a special mm -hmm. agent that they've pulled in from NASA. So it, yeah. it's also a little bit of that, of getting people thinking of where else they could come from. Um mm -hmm which I can't wait. And we're doing two books. So the second book, we're going to expand more of the agencies. And like the coolest thing I think of that's really small in the comics is the National Weather Service because they're like secretly oh, yes. the government's like uh, hitmen because <laughs> like everyone like hates them and they think that they do a horrible job. And it's actually because they don't really do the weather. <laughs> yeah. they show up in plaid suits to your house with like battle axes and like medieval oh, no. weapons and they kill you because they're just the, the, the government hitmen. Um, so I, I love some of the twisted, silly government agency things that uh, are hidden in there that will open new agencies to work for. And mm -hmm. right. The Kagushin assassins are martial arts hitmen, hitmen that are hired, hired by criminal organizations that fight with uh, kitchen utensils, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So for my beat, I put uh, undercover agent. Oh, nice. Yeah. Thought it fit very well. Um, and my look, I put auburn hair, green eyes, adorable, <laughs> feisty. <laughs> yeah, I think the prodigy's beat. Um, I would probably play into the the teenage, right? Like the teenager. Um, so mm -hmm. it'd be like high school student. Maybe even straight okay. A student, which should be fun because clearly oh, there you go. it's like, how am I involved? Am I family related yeah. or did the case happen in some way where like I was there? Was I a witness and mm -hmm. I ended up being a prodigy? Oh, that's very good. And since we went Miles Mako, maybe I'd be like in board shorts and like in surfer clothes. <laughs> so you wouldn't take me serious at all, right? Like I look like the senior who's ready to ditch. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Uh, for my beat, I put extraterrestrial research for NASA. Oh, oh, awesome. Especially okay. as a conspiracy nut. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and then my look, I put brooding and over-caffeinated. <laughs> <laughs> I love and it. And for, for my bio, I put this close to finding life on another planet until I got transferred. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Which is a great built-in oh, conspiracy, right? Like, because I could mm -hmm. see your characters like, yeah, but you know why I was transferred, right? I got too close. And right. then you know who's really running NASA, right? Who my supervisor was, because they've been planning aliens since the, like it Area 51. And, yeah, exactly. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. Oh, I would have so much fun with this character. Yeah, it would be a lot of fun. Goodness. Is that is that everything? I hope I didn't bore you with way too much information about mechanics and no. stuff. But yeah, yeah. I mean, like this was good. As you can kind of see when you actually look at the sheet, like you could check a few boxes here and you're good to go. But right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. We did that pretty quickly. But with listeners involved, yeah, I feel the well. need to be like, "Hey, this is what this is, and this is what this is, and this is why." Yeah. Well, no, I mean, and it's helpful because obviously they're not looking at the character sheet the same way yeah. we are. So, absolutely. like, we can see what all of the choices are, but you know, it helps to. Have somebody mm -hmm. to explain what we're picking from. 
So I, mm-hmm. I like talking about how there was a time not too long ago that we thought the the core attributes would be your approaches. And we loved it. We loved that it was like you're you're rolling a number of dice based on being dark and stormy or being like mm-hmm. 100 raw and using these like traits to describe how you mm-hmm. do everything. And then we were like, oh, but, you know, Fortune the Dark and Powered by the Apocalypse expect pretty nice playbooks. And that became mm-hmm. a total character sheet layout nightmare of how do you choose yeah. the tw- out of like the 20 or 50 different approaches you might want to use it's three of them. Yeah. And then have them in any way relatable on the front of your sheet. I was like pitching for like a craft project and they were like, uh-huh. oh, Pete, this is not, no. You, you're going to have a <laughs> hell of a time trying to run games and get people to jump into a chew game if you're like, here, just cut out from this sheet of paper the three approaches you like and then glue them on the sheet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, the fifth edition of Legend of the Five Rings does approaches and Dude. it's like you have, you have um, like skills are grouped and then there are five like approaches you know, like for the five rings and then they're different based on like what skill group you're sure, using. Yeah. So like your earth approach for one is like um, like recall and then for another it's like withstand and so it's like depends on what you're trying to do. Um, but it's still, you know, like that's another game that has like lots and lots of skills. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you've got like 20 some different combos of things, which is not good for a playbook. Like, sure, yeah. And, and like, I've been playing games long enough that I'm, I'm, I'm like okay with having to write everything on my sheet, you know, where they just mm-hmm. give you a sheet with like slots. But, right. you know, but then, yeah, you're like trying to be realistic about like, if you're making something in Forge in the Dark or Powered by the Apocalypse, there's kind of a standard that's already set. Right. There's expectations yeah. when I show up to a PBTA. If you're going to break that model, it probably better be for a good reason. So, right. Mm-hmm. Right. It better be a really yeah, great plan. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Is there anything else that you want people to know about the Kickstarter, about this game? Um, anything else that you want to yell at people about while you have a platform to do sure. that? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we launch on Tuesday, the 5th of October. Uh, it's going to launch okay. at 9 a.m. Uh, I believe that will be in the past <laughs> when this airs. Um, so please check out the Kickstarter. Maybe. It's Chew the Role Playing Game. Um, it's the officially licensed, licensed product from Mighty Layman Productions and Rob Guillory Incorporated. Um, the creators are working with us. They're wonderful human beings. We hope that if we do well enough, we'll bring them to Gen Con to sign all of your stuff because it'd be really neat to have like awesome known comic industry people at Gen Con out of their mm-hmm. element citing stuff for us. Um, but yeah, there's going to be, there's collector's editions of the books with slipcase that are like holographic covers. There's badges, mm-hmm. the cork boards, dry erase. If you want to get the, the full blown one for your table um, there's two books, like we said, there's going to be the core book, which is very much like if you like blades in the dark or scum and villainy or any other force in the dark book, it's going to give you, for everything you need rules wise, the core game, enough setting and factions to continue on. But if you're someone who's like, whoa, we can play Forge in the Dark with like an amazing setting with all these factions and all this history, you might want to pick the world book as well, which we call the universe, which will give us new ways of playing, advanced playbooks, mm-hmm. expand on the cybernetic animals and all kinds of stuff ton more factions so i'm really excited mm-hmm. about it i think it's it's going to be awesome uh we have a lot of amazing astral plays going on so we've the tail right now is doing a, a 10 up ep- uh yeah 10 episode weekly uh series for mm. us so you can already check that out if you go to weave the tail on twitch um nice. we have uh hyper rpg that is doing a one shot uh with some notable people and they're playing the cast from the comics so that's going to be a oh, cool. wonderful right. thing to see that should be on launch day um yeah so uh, keep tuned if you like role playing public radio. There's a whole bunch of people who've really been supportive because luckily a lot of people are like, oh, my God, I love you. <laughs> so right. it's nice. Very cool. Um, That's super cool. Yeah, I guess I'm excited. If you if you remember anything else, you can go to ImaginingGames.com and there'll be links, obviously, to Kickstarter, all the social media places, to mm-hmm. Facebook group, whatever, whatever is your jam. You can find us. Very oh, nice. Yeah. We'll put all of it in the in the notes, too. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So. Thank you so much for joining us. This was so much fun. I had a mm. great time. I got to make like <laughs> the worst version of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to remind everybody where they can find you specifically? Yeah. So again, the easiest part is if you go to imagininggames.com, you'll find all my social links. But I, I, on Twitter, I finally changed my handle, which I didn't realize you could do so easily now. Um, yeah. So it's IG underscore Pete for Imagining Games. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, we're on Instagram and Facebook and 
you know, everywhere else as well. Yeah. Very cool. Nice. Very good. All right. Uh, well, again, thank you so much uh, for joining us for this special bonus episode <laughs> of Character so Creation yeah. Spotlight. Um, yeah. And thanks to everybody else for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to check out Chew on Kickstarter, which uh, should be going on right now. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. <laughs> Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like System Mastery. System Mastery is a delightful stroll through the history of role-playing games. Except the games are terrible, and the hosts are real jerks about everything. Join hosts Jeff and John as they explore the weirdest games ever made to talk about what worked, what went wrong, and which Silverhawk was the best? It was Hot Wing. Don't even add us. Find their shows at systemmasterypodcast.com or oneshotpodcast.com. Finally. <laughs> Yay. It's there. We did it. The waves are happening. <laughs> it's so great talking to both of you. <laughs> There's just a chemistry <laughs> loss, right? Because before, it, usually it was just, you know, Ryan and I shooting. The- All language. So it's great to have a third person. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yes. Get it. Oh, right. I'm just I'm just glad that um we're able to do this uh, yeah. every now and then. Well, thank you for yeah, making the time too. I know like it's been super busy for you. Yeah, life's been a thing. <laughs> sure is a thing we have to live through. <laughs> sure is a thing we have to live through. Uh by the very definition, yes. Life, you have to live it. So should I, I should probably ask now, how did you two meet? Well, Internet. funny story. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was weird because we were in a uh, podcast support group on Twitter together. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's technically what it was. Yeah. It, te- it really is what it is, right? It was uh, just, yeah, it was like a group of people who already had podcasts and then like they would kind of casually invite friends who were like thinking about starting podcasts so that you mm-hmm. can kind of chat about the process. I don't really know like support group I don't know. <laughs> was, but like that makes it sound like I've been podcasting for four mm-hmm. years. <laughs> I've been yeah. trying to quit, but I can't. I'm trying to quit, and but I just started a new one. Yeah. I mean, literally you start a podcast and that's where it, where it goes. Right. I, yeah. I've been, st- I got too many ideas for podcasts. <laughs> I don't have Can time. Can somebody talk me down from this? Oh, now I'm doing another one? Fine. <laughs> yeah, we were we were both in that group. And then, um, I don't know, I think just because of the way the algorithm works on Twitter or something, you tweeted about 
this idea for a podcast. And yep. I was like, sounds amazing. And then the next day, Ryan was like, so want to do a podcast? And I was like, sure, dude, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but like, it turns out Ryan lives like an hour and a half north of me. Mm -hmm. um, we oh, went wow. to the same college, yeah. not at the same time, but we were, we went to the same college. Um, mm -hmm. So I used to live like right near where he lives. Um, so it's, I mean, it's worked out. Unfortunately, yeah. because of the pandemic, we can never actually record together, even I though know. we're not that far apart. But maybe someday. I'm going to have a studio that supports two people uh, at my new house, at the very least. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> It'll fit exactly uh, two people. It will, it will, I know, exactly two people and nothing else. Um, <laughs> yeah, right now it's one person and maybe a small child. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, uh, it's going to be like a 10 by 12 space. Mm -hmm. or so and enough room for at least two people maybe even a whole table wow. and uh get crazy my my goal is for us to record an episode in person one day yes at some point i would love <laughs> yeah. to do that i'd love yeah. to do that um nice, so that we can stop only quality. ever seeing each other in ohio <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> when we the go to conventions <laughs> i love that like we drive eight hours away and we're like oh it's so great to see you i only ever get to see you once a year it's like we don't live that far away like, <laughs> <I know. laughs> Hour and a half is a long ways. Oh. It's not that long. It's I less know. than eight hours. <laughs> it's much less than eight hours. We could do that like six times and still be uh, could, around. Don't it. you come down here for a game like with your friends every so often too? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You drive right past me because like Walter's well, like south of me. You drive further. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, podcast. Um, Pete, how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Petrusha. So like Petrusha. Okay. Awesome. Pe Petrusha. Petrusha. Yeah. Surprisingly Just phonetic. Just like it's spelled. Yeah, surprisingly yeah. phonetic. That's, I, I feel like people do that with last names, though. People get mine wrong all the time, and it's I'm like, it's Antrim. It's Antrim. Oh, like sure. Just how it's spelled out. But they're like atrium. And I'm like, you <laughs> oh, just no. like yeah, they see it. took out some letters and then you added a couple new ones. And then that's, that's great. <laughs> I get that so often. My game company is imagining games and people always like I get the invoices. It's always imaging. Like it just, they always cut that part out in the middle. Like their head just goes, oh, imaging. It must be imaging. You're like, I read the first few letters. That was the important part. <laughs> I don't need to worry about the rest. <laughs> and sometimes I just read the title. But it might be an autocorrect thing, too, because uh, there'd be people that clearly know what it's called. And then it, it yeah. ends. And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe it's an autocorrect thing. So maybe it's very possible. But like uh, nobody actually just, ever uh, spells imagining. Like, so it's people are just <laughs> using Outlook from 1998 and Clippy keeps on popping up. Did you mean <laughs> imaging? <laughs> And then you just say yes, just to pacify him, so he'll yep, leave you alone. Exactly, mm -hmm. because Clippy doesn't leave you alone. Clippy is like a toddler. Him, okay. I forgot Clippy existed. Follows you around. <laughs> I love Clippy. Oh. Okay. All right, I'm going to do a five count of silence to get some background noise, okay. and then we'll go ahead and start if everybody's good. Yeah, do mm -hmm. you hear my fans at all or anything? No. Um. No, I don't think so. E even if we, even if we get it picked up on your mic, um. Uh, we should be able to filter that up. I hear a motorcycle yeah. outside. It's like chug, 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 chug. But oh, yeah, this might be problem. Oh, do you? I was like, with this mic. No, I not. said I don't. Yeah. I don't. No. Yeah. I'm sure um, though Yeti's probably picking up in audacity, but you know, who cares? That's what the that's five fine. seconds is for to get yeah. that background. Exactly. Bumpies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I have to finish typing with my keyboard loud. <laughs> Clicky clack. Bye. Ciao. Bye. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> oh, no. Bon appetit. Oh, food puns <laughs> right at the end. <laughs>